And uh, so welcome. This is our first uh, attempt at doing a town hall meeting. Uh, so please bear with us. We have no idea exactly how it's going to work out because uh, I was telling Sue today um, that it could be as little as 10 people or as many as uh, maybe uh, 100 or more. So within that range, here you go. <laughs> um, so um, what, why did we do this? Why did we think that a town hall meeting is an, an interesting way to go? Well, uh, Chris Whitaker and uh, Selma uh, Hamdani and uh, the Salties team, we had a meeting and um, as we were meeting, we were talking about what uh, the, the Dawson Active Learning community has been doing. Uh, we call them the DALC or DALC. Uh, and what they've been doing is on a regular basis throughout the last uh, nine weeks, they were having a Friday meeting where they brought people together as community. And it would just be a drop-in. So, you know, at any one Friday, you had anywhere between uh, maybe 10 to 20 people show up. And it was a really positive experience. People got a chance to feel uh, that they could express uh, problems that they were having, uh, great ideas that they came up with that week. Um, but everything was in the moment. Uh, that, that sense of uh, being present in this very special moment with others and being with others helps us think together in the truest sense of the word community. Um, so we thought, why not extend this idea to the Saltees community, which is interinstitutional, and that way we get a sense of what 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 has this experience this unprecedented time what has this experience been like for all of us and what are the lessons learned so both the things that are what is our biggest fear uh perhaps for this you know the un you know the the, the unknown the uh you know this this time of uncertainty but more than anything else focusing on uh what is uh, uh um what is our biggest opportunity? Uh, what are the things that we should be taking forward uh, as knowledge? What are the things that we should be taking forward as ways of thinking? And always this with the sense that uh, Saltese is made up of practitioners and researchers. So as practitioners, uh, what is it that is, is happening in your lives? but also what is researchers as people from the learning sciences, from the computer supported collaborative uh, uh, learning, uh, computer supported collaborative learning communities, CSCL community, people from um, education technology, people from just education in general. What are, those, what are those things that you care about that you might want to learn from this experience? So those are the things that sort of shape these, uh, these next three days. Um, and, uh, and certainly starting with today, uh, this is you know, the, the uh, let's, let's put a few of these ideas on the table. In the next three days, what's gonna, the, the next two days after this, um, Chris Whitaker is going to talk about some very specific ways of doing, um, you called it patagé, and maybe I'll have you maybe speak to that in a, in a moment, Chris. And then uh, um, Michael Dugdale uh, will do Thursday with an idea of how to do a flipped classroom, perhaps. So how do you use a new, these new um, engagement approaches in this online environment? Again, at this very high level way of thinking, um, we're not trying to solve necessarily a very, very specific problem that you have in your in your environment, your classroom, or your research uh, lab, but we're trying to understand globally uh, some of these ideas and sharing as community. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm gonna to uh, my, my co-host moderator. Uh, so today we're not 
talking specifically about ourselves and, and doing a big talk. We're really setting the stage. So I'd like to, to set the stage with Jim Sloda. So Jim is from the University of Toronto, the OISE, uh, uh, the OISE campus, which OISE stands for Ontario Institute of Studies in Education, and they are the School of Education. Uh, Jim has, you know, is um, a research chair uh, at, at OISE, in addition to being a, a very well-loved uh, faculty member. Uh, many of his students have gone on to doing incredible work and um, in the learning sciences. Uh, Jim has a long history of looking at uh, how to design technologies to support uh, student engagement, student learning. Uh, he is uh, responsible for a group of uh, K through 12 instructors who are looking at this uh, very um, challenging new world of online instruction and having conversations like we've been having here. Uh, so these are the kinds of, um, yeah, so these are, these, these conversations are going to both, um, that Jim is having can both enrich what we are, we are experiencing, uh, at, but his conversations can enrich us as well. So uh, again, with this sort of two way street. So um, without further ado, Jim, I'd like you introduce yourself and then maybe Chris and, 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 uh, Every time I see Captain Proton, I have a hard time saying Michael Dugdale. I, I, I want to say Captain Proton. Uh, but Michael Dugdale, maybe the two of you can just briefly say, you know, like how you imagine um, uh, Wednesday and Thursday uh, happening. But first, Jim, just introduce yourself. Okay, so we'll, we'll start day one after we do the introductions. Um, I'm Jim Slada. I'm a professor of um, education and technology. I've been involved in Salties from the beginning um, and really delighted to be part of this community. Um, and it makes sense that this discussion would be happening. My work in the before times in the long ago <coughs> um, was focused on classroom communities back when we had classrooms and how we can leverage that community as an asset to the learner, how we can create active learning designs that engage peers, but you know, with the uh, epistemic understanding that they are being engaged in relation to a community of learners, that that community is part of their learning and that they're contributing to that community. So I have been working in you know, a theoretical uh, space around that and putting, putting those models into practice. A lot of secondary science has been my domain but a little bit of higher ed as well. So I follow Saltese, I present at Saltese um, each year, and, and it's really cool that this is happening now because it's sort of like we're taking back the conference and we have a chance <clears throat> to get Saltese anyway. So pretty excited, but I'll let, I'll let Michael and, and Chris say hello. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Chris Whitaker. I coordinate the uh... Dawson Active Learning Community, uh, along with Selma Hem Hemdani. Uh, and um, over the last, as Liz said, we've been meeting a fair amount. And over the last week in particular, uh, the DLC has been meeting to, you know, once classes were over, uh, to do a little bit of a look in the rearview mirror about how uh, things went this semester start thinking about how we can prepare ourselves better for the fall. And one of the questions that we, um, that came up was, you know, how are the platforms, the technology platforms that we've been using um, serving us and serving the, the, the learning activities we want to engage our students in. And so, you know, quite rightly, our, our college has been aware of uh, a little bit of technology fatigue amongst students and amongst faculty. But, um, you know, we, we in our conversations kept thinking, so, so we, we are not using Google Docs, we're not using Teams, uh, you know, we've decided to use Moodle and Zoom. But every time we talk about technology, someone says, I think Teams does that a whole lot better. Or how are people doing online exams? Or what about using Google Docs? And so what we thought was we should expand and learn from each other because each of our institutions is, is doing something slightly different using technology 
different technologies or the same technologies in slightly different ways. And so what we wanted to do is have a conversation so that we could learn from each other what's what's working, what's not working, um, so that we can you know push our institution to, to make um, maybe different or better choices or to help us focus. So the, the topic of the day for tomorrow, we'll be looking, to, uh, looking forward to the fall uh, and just talking about all the different kinds of technology platforms that we've all been using at our different institutions, um, the good, the bad, the ugly, and uh, with, with an eye to, to, to making things better in the fall. So tomorrow's theme at this time, uh, we'll be uh, sharing technologies and platforms and the things that have been working or not working for all of us. Hey, and uh, I'm Michael Dugdale. I'm a physics prof at John Abbott College and uh, I've been involved with Salties for ever and uh, so, since it's very early days and uh, really have learned I've learned an incredible uh, an incredible amount from this uh, community. Uh, the Thursday's um, roundtable will be on on the nature of the flipped classroom and is sort of I think Liz uh, or Chris proposed this, I'm not sure the, the origin of it, but I think it's a fascinating idea that here we have a situation where a lot of teachers have been thrown into using technologies that they weren't uh, aware of and, and, that, and we've adapted as best we could in a very rushed time. It looks like we are going to be online in the fall um, that they, if uh, our administrations are to be believed. And it's time now to think about the, you know, good effective designs in the use of these technologies. Now the interesting thing here is that they're in, um, in our typical sort of flipped classroom arrangement and the flipped classroom is where you sort of invert the role of homework and, uh, and class time where you um, sort of put, make the homework the pre-reading and getting ready for the class and the class is, you can devote a lot more time to kind of, uh, you know, these deeper knowledge construction exercises. Uh, is sort of an, it becomes an interesting feature in these sort of, um, in, 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 the, in this um, online only or a blended format, where now that the clear distinction between what's class time and what's out of class time, the synchronous and the asynchronous parts, are, those lines blur. And we have a little bit of um, freedom to maybe implement some different ideas and, uh, you know, while at the same time trying to look at what, what is principal pedagogy. And so I really wanted to that, that I, that conversation and to see what people are thinking and maybe expose uh, and learn from each other on, uh, you know, how, how we're thinking about this problem as we start looking uh, at preparing for next semester over the, over the summer. Um, it might give some good ideas and might sensitize us to issues that we might uh, we might not have all uh, been aware of. And uh, I'm look, looking forward to hearing what uh, the community has to offer. <clears throat> okay, do you want me to pick, pick back up, Liz? Okay. Yeah. Um, so that's what we thought you might want to talk about, but we don't know what you want to talk about. <clears throat> um, maybe we will talk about those things tomorrow and the next day. Uh, maybe there will be mutiny and we'll talk about something else. Um, we, I mean, does everybody feel normal? <laughs> Look at, look at my background, Jim. I know, you're about to get eaten by a giant Elmo. Like, uh, honestly, the world is not normal anymore. I mean, this is three months in now. And uh, <clears throat> we're reading about how things aren't going to go back to normal, maybe for, an, who knows, right, for another year before, will we ever feel like we can do active learning designs like a, a jigsaw is actually an ideal strategy for passing viruses around. Um, so, you know, uh, I just want to say that part, part of, uh, we were being a little careful when we thought about this um, and we haven't had a ton of time to put, put this together. <clears throat> it's great that it, that it did come together. But part of it was to try to be a little more um, just open to what might come out of this because we're really not sure in these non-normal times what the community needs. And um, I said, well, I'll tell a little bit of my story 
<clears throat> and sorry, I've been on Zoom now for seven hours. Um, this is my, um, I don't know how many meeting today, which <laughs> you guys probably have that too. I've been working to imagine a teacher community over the summer for K-12 teachers. Um, and I've been talking to a lot of people about this <clears throat> for weeks. So it's in contrast to the present case where this is coming together very quickly. We're actually being a lot more, maybe even overthinking what we're doing this summer with our K-12 um, folks. But um, the idea was, you know, hey, the normal is gone. The new normal is not even, <clears throat> we don't even know what that means. And we just know that there's going to be a lot of design work that people have to do this summer. And maybe we can, in, in our research group, we can, we had been thinking to organize a summer design group around a particular kind of curriculum. Maybe we can open it up a little bit more and just try to help support teachers to figure out how they're gonna to respond to some of these big new um, asks that are coming their way, <clears throat> which is even more tricky because we don't know exactly what those asks are. But in the case of K-12, we're pretty sure they're gonna be um, a mix of some classroom with crazy constraints that makes you wanna even doubt whether that's a value added like half the school comes for one week and the other half goes the other week and students only see 15 people all day and they constantly carrying around cleanser. I, I'm not actually sure what is happening, but I know they're working hard on, on it and everyone's in the same boat, right? Including, including leaders. So everyone's just trying to do the best they can and stay cool like the Fonz. But, um, you know, the more we started talking about this, people started raising the question like, well, do you even know what teachers need right now? You know, there's, there's enough worry and there's enough anxiety, um, anger, but not even clear what, uh, people are going a bit nuts with this lockdown. I mean, this is our third month of this. And uh, friend, uh, there's a friend in France wrote to say there's this syndrome they call uh, syndrome de la cabane, which, is something like the opposite of cabin fever, where cabin fever, you kind of <clears throat> have to get out and get to it, but there's now this kind of thing setting in where people actually are afraid of interacting with others. So I guess where I'm coming from now is that the kind of conversations we're having about <clears throat> how to support a community uh, of, of practitioners, which this would be one that we're gathered here now, <clears throat> is that the very first thing we need to do as a community is think, you know, listen to each other about what we think we need um, and hear what the issues are. I mean, in higher education, we know, we don't know a lot about what's coming our way, but we, we know there's going to be financial distress. Um, in the States, this is probably going to be worse than in Canada, but I'm guessing Canada's not going to escape it. Um, there's going to be a lot of uh, travel restrictions on the very large number of international students that we rely on to come and help pay tuition. There's going to be institutions in duress. There's going to be people worrying about jobs. <clears throat> Active learning. Um, like, you know, I'm not a fan of online learning. I'll make that plain and clear right now. I don't think that it's a great way to learn. I know we're always learning, you know, learning right now. Uh, online, but I'm a fan of classroom learning. I'm a fan of interactions. I'm a fan of deep, um, thick bandwidth communication, uh, small groups, um, active um, flipped classroom where the homework that you do at home really comes back into play in the class when you're there. And, and so the idea that we're going to try to move all that to be online is almost like makes me want to jump out the window. I just, I don't even want to try to pretend that that's a good idea. On the other hand, we kind of have to. So there's no choice but to go, to go into battle and the, the show must go on. And, and here we all are as educators who share that interest and that commitment in rich forms of learning. That's a great thing about Saltees. Um, I, so, so at some level we're being asked to do, you know, a very challenging thing, which is to keep that spirit of interaction and of, of, of uh, collaboration and inquiry um, building on ideas and, and against the threat of, you know, the kind of most 
lowest common denominator for online learning is really coverage. And um, like uh, Liz said, many of us don't have a lot of experience doing online learning. Many of us uh, are almost, you know, you could say not interested in, in learning how to do online learning. But here we are. And as Saltese, it's a, it's a really well-defined, um, well, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a close-knit community with a, a clear charter to improve learning and to improve the kind of interactions to leverage technology. And it may be that we're online, but we're still human and to leverage human contact, connection, collaboration, and, and, and essentially do the best we can in the face of this, uh, this nutty uh, 2020 uh, world that we live in. So that's my, my way of contexting how we thought about today was that we could uh, get together and listen to each other a bit. Um, we got 40 of us, which might be a 50 now, uh, probably a bit too many to keep in, in one room. But we, we just wanted to launch this by opening up the discussion about your reflections, your worries, your, um, you know, maybe your hopes for what could be next year, um, uh, just discussions about um, the constraints that we're facing, uh, and, and then move it into these next, you know, like the, at the end of today, we would hope to have some, you know, pretty good sense of each other and what we're all facing and how we think we can give energy to this, um, what kind of support we think we might need going forward and what are the sort of key ideas that we want to try to emphasize in the next couple of days. And then as we go into the next two days, um, and I'm sorry, uh, Michael, I won't be able to join that Thursday because I've got a all day, <laughs> unless my faculty meeting gets over, I've got a seven hour faculty meeting on Thursday. But that we would, uh, we would spend some time kind of discussing these things in small groups. And Liz has been preparing um, some docs for us but maybe before we do, just because we're all in one group, if we just spend a few minutes listening to voices that might want to add something for everybody, um, and what what are you reflecting on at this point, and what are you hoping to get out of the next three days? Go ahead. Just um, you know, it's going to be hard to call on people, so I think we should just uh, pretend we're. Uh, in a big room and just to try to, we can use a hand raising, just try to speak and see what happens. Uh, Eva Marie. Hi, I just wanted to, um, I wanted to say that for me, the active learning and online learning go along really, really well together, but I've definitely seen my colleagues not have that feeling. So to me, there's some kind of positive, um, potential that some of the constraints that make it hard to do active learning are kind of disappearing in all the chaos and allow for maybe some some wonderful opportunities but we're not used to that idea yet so when I first taught online it was the 90s and we didn't even have anything fancy and yet a class of 80 we divided into four groups of 20 and the students felt like they were in classes of 20 and they had all this interaction with the faculty member and with each other. But a lot of the talk I'm hearing is not like that kind of online learning. So I think there's a wide breadth of what online learning could look like. And I worry that we might end up at sort of the, a low end denominator here because of the way we think about what education is. Like it comes back to what we think really matters. And if we think students gaining a lot of content really matters, and the proctoring of exams, huge issue people are worried about. But that reflects these um, memorization metaphors of what an educator does is, you know, and, and if we think of it differently, it might, but it's a huge shift of thinking for a lot of people and plus the technology. So, but I, I have some optimism, woo, me optimistic. <laughs> we need that, we need that. <laughs> oh, Jasmine. Hi, um, I actually just wanna, uh, add to what Eva Marie is saying. So I'm a new faculty lecturer at McGill University, and I think it could just be that I am new, that I'm really excited. But 
Um, I do see like this as kind of like a blessing in disguise because now we're seeing um, more per, uh, professors in, in my case, um, the ones that I'm working with are moving more towards active learning because now they kind of have to now that it's uh, it's remote um, before it would just be lecture final exam or a midterm and now they're trying to find different ways to make it less content based but more student based and seeing you know what are different ways that we can keep the students engaged rather than just having a three-hour lecture a week so I see this as really in a way a blessing in disguise like uh, redesigning your class and hopefully there are some techniques that we use this semester this coming semester that we can continue to use uh, in the future I think what's really scaring a lot of um, educators is the the technology in general so I'm really excited for tomorrow and see what I can um, bring to the table with my colleagues because some professors for example zoom is new for them and it might be scary to just learn a little bit more for example about crowdmark which is a great platform to um, evaluate final exams so i think that's one thing that i noticed a lot of professors are scared about um, but i'm really excited about the new strategies that we can use for active learning I like those optimistic voices. That's actually a neat idea that at the end of the day, we all end up back in the classroom, I hope, and then it'll never be the same again. Like, There's what was it like before? I don't remember. Like, but we've got all these new practices that we just kind of now suddenly have more of a fluency in, and, and maybe they can stick with us. That's, that's, uh, that's great. Proton? No? Oh, well, I'm, 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 I'm slightly... Sorry, Captain Proton, Captain. I'm, how can I put it? Perhaps I'm still in the, the angry phase of, uh, of, of, of uh, the, the, these last few. Um, yeah, I'm decidedly at the moment less optimistic just in, in, in terms of uh, my interactions with a lot of my colleagues. And I think we're really framing the challenges very differently. And whereas it seems to be a matter of content and uh, in uh, in, um, in 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 the discussions seem to invariably go to content and uh, platform and what you're doing is not about the design and I'm 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 finding myself very frustrated and um, and that I find I, I, so I'm, I'm you know I ask me in two weeks I might be a lot more chill about it but I, I, I in a, in at the moment I'm a little concerned about how many people thought they did an absolutely marvelous job this this year. I mean, we, in a way we did, we had, you know, we got through it, we survived, but this, you know, the out, the learning outcomes weren't comparable to what our, we would normally do and nor should we have expected them to be. I'm not meaning that, but the, the number who are, the number who think that this went really well has me a little disturbed and, and, and worried about sort of decision-making going forward. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm. I'm. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, I, 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 I. I'm not in that optimistic group at the moment. So ho hopefully, this conversation will drag me back there. Well, no. I think you need, you need both. You know, and the students. Let's not forget. You know, imagine somebody took all of our students, all of them, and whacked them hard with some spin. You know, some negative spin. I think the students are really massively anxious and worried, and they should be. So, so that's a that's a hard factor in this too. We we don't know what what they're going to be like. Why are they even in school? Why are they in school? Um, or to get you know, a good degree? Some of these mythologies are starting to become more relativistic, and I think that's part of the conversation that's going to happen in higher education. It's already happening in K twelve. Um, so, so maybe there's some positive there too that we can finally, you know exercise out some of these things um but but it's 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 not negative or po uh, you know it's not about whether it's negative or positive i think it's important to kind of as for this community to really grapple with the existential stuff that's going on um across the board and that that's not just financial and um and economic it's institutional and it's the workplace uh it's uh 
meaning and purpose. Why are, why are kids coming to school? Uh, the status quo was a, an assumed beast, and, uh, and I think that has always been a dangerous assumption. Uh, uh, other people, Miriam, you had something. Yes, um, I wanted to share some of the concerns. Uh, oh, hi, my name is Miriam, and I work for the Dawson uh, Artificial Intelligence team at uh, Dawson College. And what our team's members are, are really concerned about, especially one in particular, I won't say his name, but privacy has become a really big issue because not just in proctoring exams, but the software that's being used. And he gave an example of, um, for instance, if you have a student and they're being, um, having a proctored exam where the AI is monitoring them on the video feed, but for it to be, like a closed book exam, they can't have anything in the, the view of the camera anyway that relates to what the exam is about. Or they have, you know, their pictures of friends and stuff in the background. How is that like the, his friends didn't agree to have their photos in this exam? Like, how do you even get like monitor and, and, and prepare for things like that? And, and it's, it's just been such a, an interesting conversation to have in general, just because it, it brings up so many different issues about privacy and how some students may not want to be recorded at all whatsoever. How do you accommodate those students or students who have, um, don't have the resources to, they don't have a fast enough internet or they don't have enough uh, like equipment that, this, this, that's um, powerful enough to actually have uh, this kind of exam administered. So it's, it's just, it's really interesting. And, and like, I feel a bit like Michael, Doug Dale, it's, it's, it's discouraging because I feel like no one's really prepared much for this. And because we don't have all the answers, some people are just kind of having these opinions that I find like in the discussions that the faculty of Dawson has been having, there's some really hard staunch opposers to the technologies that they haven't really experienced or evaluated themselves, which I find kind of discouraging and alarming. So. Anyway, I'm really glad to, that we're having this town hall meeting and just, you know, bringing these things to the fore so that maybe we can maybe not find solutions by the end of this town hall, but at least start thinking about them. So I'm really glad that Saltis and Liz and the team have put this together. Selma? So one, one second, uh, Selma. Um, uh, we did, I've, I've organized um, breakout rooms with, um, so five breakout rooms if people want to move in after uh, Selma and Chris speak, if you want to. But if you're happy in this format, we're also good. So it, it's up to you. Just let <laughs> us know. I guess you let us know by typing in the text box. If you do go into breakout rooms, you get 10 people really focused on saying what you want to say. And we come back and we, we, we um, show those and kind of talk. So it's... It's kind of a, there's some trade-off, obviously. So can I, is it my turn to speak? Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Selma, I'm the co-coordinator of the DLC with Chris, and uh, I guess I fall in the optimist camp. <laughs> um, so uh, this semester is, is uh, or the half of the semester has caught us by surprise, and I think that's, probably what's what's uh, uh, fueling a lot of the uncertainty or some of the the the, the negative views of what of how the semester happened uh, right we all had to just suddenly adjust to this completely different way of, of interacting with our students of learning of teaching of the whole thing um, if so maybe just like the the having the element of surprise dissipate might change our perspective. And I feel like, uh, yes, there's a lot of frustration. There's a lot of discussion about just content, but how do I get this content to the students and which platform do I use? I have this, this like a scatter plot of, of, of information out there and I just have to f like parse my way through it. And, um, if we have time, if we had time to prepare, I feel like it would maybe this would have we would have seen like the, the pattern in the scatter plot or or found our own paths through the, the scatter plot. So I'm hopeful that the next semester, since many of us are, are going online and we're already 
like preparing and having the mindset of going uh, uh, online and uh, getting ready for it will will get us ready for it it's all about i think it's all about how you how you tackle the 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 problem when it's imposed on you it's it's much it seems much bigger but then when you're ready for it it seems a little bit less daunting um i had a little bit of experience of blended learning as some some people probably in this in this uh, group have before the 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 health crisis happened and uh, even I found the the, the imposed 100% online teaching to be just a, a, a daunting task. But I've seen some of my colleagues that have come so far from, like, from where they started. Some some of my colleagues barely knew how to use PowerPoint, and they were asked to teach online. Uh, suddenly using all sorts of platforms and all sorts of like tools that they've never even heard of uh, before. And, and I found that to be so uh, encouraging because, uh, I mean, they did it. <laughs> Maybe not perfectly, but it, it happened. So I think, I think that this, uh, these, this, uh, this week's uh, plans and these conversations we're having can only make things better and and maybe quell some of that tension and 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 uh, apprehension about online teaching or maybe that's the hope I just feel like if we have time to think and sit down and plan this it, it can happen if, or maybe that's just the optimist in me and that's it I like the optimist. I think we need this. You know, it, it's what's going to carry us through. If we all were negative and pessimistic, it ain't going to work at all. So thank you for that. And I think maybe that's part of what this community can do. And I'm going to learn this. I'm going to learn from this and bring this into my K-12 community is we don't need a bunch of people. You know, we do need to understand the, the issues and the, what, what's at risk, but we also can always say yes, right? We can always say yes. Um, so we're seeing a lot of people like this kind of plenary format. Um, we still I think could, it was, yeah. yeah, I was going to say, uh, there was Chris and, and Valerie, uh, so far that I, I'm just keeping track. We could also use the Google doc, um, as a side thing, like this chat is going on right now, which is kind of cool but we could open up one of the Google Docs. I was starting to, they get long when you have lots of people typing in them. So I, I was uh, editing number one here to just sort of make the questions more salient and we could we could send out the, um, we could send out with uh, the URL, something just happened, exit. Hold on. Uh, you're, you so, just, <laughs> anyone, I, yeah. can, anyone can edit. Um, at the moment, that's not. No, I'm just changing it, but somebody, oh, okay. Liz stole my screen, but I gave it back oh, to her. So, so, yeah, sorry. I just wanted to show people what we're talking about, just in case they thought, what do Google Docs? Right. Okay. So we're just, yeah, so, we're just yeah. making uh, one of these Google Docs. This is active learning in real time. Scripting, never script during class. Oh, yes, you can. There. There's a doc. Um, you can add some notes there, but we can keep talking. Um, I think the institutions are another good question. We, we uh, are hearing from you know, people south of the border that there are programs being collapsed and courses, you know, are being eliminated and all this stuff. And it's to, to me kind of seems like one shoe dropping and there's, there's other shoes to drop. So, um, you know, it's a kind of a good question for me, how this is going to affect the, the academy more generally and what we do with optimism or, or, or not. It's, you know, there's some responsibility we have toward the institution uh, and trying to figure out how to help it sort of move forward through this. And um, I'm just stunned by some of the things I'm reading and, and like the whole, the whole purpose of 
the university has been in question for a while now, and e-learning is not um, is, is 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 actually a a problematic force for those who love uh, the online learning. Uh, unfortunately, you don't need a university, you know, to do it. So um, some of the very best things about universities that we love are kind of imperiled by, <clears throat> you know, um, potential. Uh, commoditization of this kind of instruction. Still, um, I think, you know, basically we can't do anything but operate within the world that we're in. And uh, and somebody says you might not need it. Yeah, yeah, it's true. So Stanford University wants to have 1.5 million enrollment by uh, 2025. Okay. And if they partner with Google, you know, whoa, they could do big things. And with a ton of talent for teaching all kinds of stuff because you can do it online now. I'm just saying. Um, you, you know, well, I think it is there, Chris, is there a line? Chris, yeah, Chris and, and Val, uh, and then maybe Eva. Yeah, I was gonna uh, say that I, uh, like a good physicist, I think I'm both optimistic and pessimistic at the same time. I'm in a multiple, I'm in multiple states. Um, and uh, I appreciate Jasmine's comment about, you know, seeing the positive. And I, and I do see something positive for the future. I, I really think the, the fact that we've been forced to go over this little learning curve has uh, made, you know, the, f the, the discussion about a f what a flipped classroom really can be and what we really want to do in person so much more relevant in the future. So hopefully we can, you know, we can shovel some of the content out of classrooms more broadly and make class time more about quality construction and learning and uh, so I'm, I'm hopeful about that but I'm uh, I'm gonna sort of leapfrog off what Selma said and be pessimistic because I think in the con conversations that we've been having with the uh, active learning folks at Dawson it's just so apparent to me that there are way too many tensions in in this whole thing that are going to only get worse in the fall because we were shoved into this thing in the in the uh, suddenly um we we had a lot of flexibility we had a lot of leeway to uh to adjust things um so for example at the sagep level there's a standardized way of scoring students so that they can be compared from one class one sagep one institution to the other uh and so the you know the r score wasn't there was no counting towards the R score this semester, but that's changing in the fall. So students are gonna be much, much more um, nervous, concerned, aware of inequities. And I think we, you know, in balancing this need to standardize things, because I think people, you know, there's something to be said about standardization in, in an online setting, you know, having a pattern, repeating a pattern, uh, is important um, and yet at the same time we've got to have incredible flexibility because some students are learning to adapt are uh, you know don't have the same access to technology uh, and so there are all these tensions you know between the the the, the standardization and the flexibility um, you know that I, I really think we're fooling ourselves if we really think that we're getting to the depth of knowledge and learning that we had before and yet now sort of we're being put back into all of the restraints we had before you know it it, it was okay for us to kind of cut corners this semester it's not going to be okay for us to do it next semester our students are going to be more aware of it so i'm really worried that we're just going to sort of get a, a a handle on what just happened and then we're going to be thrown into a whole new ball game in the fall and we won't be ready for that. So I, I don't want to rain on the parade too much, but I, I am concerned about all the tensions that we're going to have to deal with. And these, you know, the, the, the immovable object meeting, you know, a large force, um, something's going to have to give and I don't know where that's going to happen. Um, but I do think that we can help each other. Uh, you know, there are things about, you know, that I've learned in my active learning classroom that I will apply to my online classroom. And those are things like, you know, setting norms from the beginning, setting expectations. I think that's going to be hugely important, right? So if, if we can set up 
patterns and expectations clearly at the beginning, I think that's going to smooth our way through things. And that's the kind of, I'm hoping we're going to get to those kinds of conversations. Like what are some of the key things we have to do as a, uh, as institutions, as uh, pedagogues, so that we can make things work for our students. Um, but I am worried that the game is going to change and, uh, you know, come the fall. Val? Val? I, I mean, I, I don't want to respond to uh, you, Chris, because you raised some really important points. I think Val has had her hand up for a while, so we'll respond later. Well, that's okay. I, I was actually, I share a lot of the same concerns as Chris. I have to say, I also share Selma's um, optimism in that I see a lot of opportunities here. Um, I was going through your list of different kinds of active learning on the Salties website, checking off all the ones that I used since I went online to see if I actually increased. So all of that I see as positive. Um, I, I think this is a great time to really push the idea of showing students that sort of critical thinking and self-directed learning that we've been talking about for years. Well, now we have to show them how to do that. I'll show you, I'll tell you where one of my biggest concerns is outside of everything that Chris just mentioned, because um, I've, I've had conversations in his group about this. And that's what's going to happen to my program because we've all sort of seen that we've had to make adjustments to content and how much content we deliver um, on an online space. And I'm at, at the best of times, some SEJA programs are not super well aligned and we're start, we, you start to have a few gaps in learning and so on and so forth. And I can't help thinking with the survival mode that teachers are in and, and the adjustments that teachers might be making to their courses that curriculum alignment across a single discipline might start to fall apart a little bit um, as we start sort of either skipping steps or I mean I, I already know in my own department when I'm getting students coming in from this course I have a fair idea of the level they're at and where I need to start and I have the feeling that's going to go out the window a little bit um as we're as we're all making adjustments as we go with what content we feel we need to cover and what content really isn't necessary or appropriate for our new reality so i think that's one of my bigger concerns is my whole program going to fall apart and am i gonna like because we're I, there's not really tons of time for programs to map this like in other words to remap the curriculum if it needs to be remapped in any way to make these adjustments um so i guess uh, it, you know when we're bringing in students out of high school into first year and it, everything's already overwhelming for them if we have a lot of gaps and redundancies in our program and that increases due to the fact that we're kind of all on our own in this wild wild west or semi on our own i mean i don't feel i'm on my own in this space but none of you are work in my program with me so i'm really specifically talking about my team and my program um, and I and you all may feel the same way may I see Captain Proton nodding his head um, that yeah the, the we might have some problems with curriculum alignment uh, moving forward because there doesn't seem to be enough time for us to work on that as a team as we're all trying to figure out well what platform are we going to agree to use at the best of time so I think that's one of my bigger concerns right now thank you Liz Just jump, jump in if you want to say something. Um. <laughs> I wanted to go back to something that Michael said. I think it was Michael about being feeling negative, about how positive people are talking about how things went. And I too have been really surprised by that. Um, it seems like we made it. We graduated some people. We didn't die. We didn't hey, die. You know, it, it, it's like pandemic crisis teaching and i think it is a different standard but yeah i think it's true yeah. in the fall we still we still will have some people who are in you know in crisis but a lot of us won't be in the same crisis mode and i think our expectations should be a lot higher than just making it through which is what happened 
at the beginning. Um, and the other thing I wanted to add was from what Jim was saying about the, the what is a university for? And I personally don't have a problem with like our fourth year students who've been with us forever having their classes online and I think it'll be fine. But the first years, the second years, like this is not what a university is to me. I know some people do that. It's not that any single one course online isn't as valuable as a face-to-face -face course, but the experience. And I wonder how we can, like I know we're all at different places. And so Dawson is a, you know, out in the bishops, out in the townships in Quebec, we will likely have a hybrid kind of solution with some students will be with us. But at some places, I just don't know how you'll create community for students who are coming in, learning what it means to be an academic, learning what it means to be a student. Um, those are the people I'm totally worried about, the, the beginning students. And, and to me, I was, I was trying, I had weird ideas like, well, just because you can't be in class together, you can still have an orientation outside, mm -hmm. um, gather together, mm -hmm. six feet apart. But it doesn't really address this huge concern of, well, a university is a lot more than a, adding together your classes. And right. will we still have our research groups meet? Will we still work with our students face to face and outside of the classroom? Right. We, we have to have the stories. This is what I meant by the word mythologies, like Joseph Campbell type mythologies. We have to have the stories that we tell them but we have to tell them that with confidence that we believe those stories. And I don't actually think we've totally rehearsed and digested those stories very much over the years because we haven't had to, because that's what the status quo does for you. It gives you the truth. You inherit that truth. Everybody says, go to university and you know, get a good job. And the teachers at university can just do their thing. But when all of that has been kind of blenderized and, kids are kind of showing up now on faith that, you know, something good's going to happen. I think that it becomes even more important for educators to have, to have really clear, confidently held stories to tell that 18 year old why you're in school, what this is about to pick a program, you know, what is the program about at McGill or at Concordia or at Dawson? where are we going with this and what is my goal for you as a learner and i think a lot of that stuff was was taken kind of for granted and not deeply like um owned you know to to to, to have to essentially take ownership and and define it for yourself and now we're going to be called to because of this you know <laughs> new day that we have we're, we're basically going to be asked to help reclaim you know some of those mythologies and and to really help our students who are are probably you know imagine you know these kids at home all around the the city and the, the country looking to their mom and dad saying like it's just going to be all right right i mean it's it's not going to be the great depression and um you're going to get your job back and like the parents need to look back at their kids and say it's going to be fine we're going to be fine the economy is going to the government's going to so we need to be doing that in education too, but, but it's hard sometimes when you're not actually that sure. Alice? Yeah, so uh, first I'm introduce myself. I'm Alice Gerestes. I uh, teach at um, McGill at the McDonald campus, and I'm also the director of the freshman program, so I do deal with um, the first years from um, outside of the province. Um, I do have some CJAP kids because I do teach a UN course as well. So a couple of comments. First of all, when we're talking about program continuity, um, there is a, a very big program continuity, as you mentioned, uh, you know, they come from high school, they go into CJAP year one, and then they come to us. Uh, we see them in, uh, I see them in organic chemistry in U1, coming from all sorts of different CJAPs with absolutely totally different uh, knowledge or learning outcomes, if you want. So there is, um, we're already kind of picking up some slack from a diversity of um, approaches that the CJEPs are using. And I think the gap there is gonna be so much bigger now because even with the incoming class, we don't know how all of them finished. That's number one. Now, number two, when we're talking about quality programs, um, 
Uh, so most of my students are international and I'm under a tremendous amount of pressure. I mean, these kids are gonna be paying $40,000 tuition and whatever I'm gonna put online, I better make it worth their $40,000 because otherwise, uh, why are they coming? But something to remember is that it's temporary. I mean, we're hoping to be on in person in winter. I don't guarantee that we're going to be teaching in person in winter. So I'm kind of looking for probably to another online semester in winter. We don't know. But so max is going to be one year out of their four years. So yes, it's tough, but I think we really have to play up the, the temporary um, aspect. Um, and to building community, and probably this is one of my biggest fears, is uh, the international students and the different time zones. And that, that the different time zones, and I keep on harping about it in every meeting I go, um, it's going to affect building community. It's going to affect student interaction. It's going to affect how we give exams. Um, if I cannot have an exam at 1 o'clock in the afternoon for two hours at my class time because it's one o'clock in the morning somewhere else it changes everything into how are we evaluating these kids sorry that's all i have to say i'm not very positive i know chris hi i'm uh, chris roderick from dawson college in the physics department uh i'm somewhere between uh eva mary Rez and captain proton emotionally uh, part of me is optimistic because I had an opportunity or well, I was forced to try a number of different things that I never would have done previously. And I'm also pessimistic because I know there's things that I won't be able to achieve anymore. Um, I, I was prompted to talk because of something you said, Jim, uh, this idea of that there's, there's something literal about the, the architecture, the edifice, this, this, uh, this, this, uh, this mass that people are attracted to and somehow that space in some way defines some kind of uh, validity or value. It's like, oh, look at this gigantic building. It has to be important. And without, with that stripped away, what, what, how do you point to saying, well, there's education there. Where's that idea manifested physically? It's no longer there. Um, I think that the, we have to maybe let go of that it's a it's a it's a preserve a life preserver we've been clinging to for a long time and strip away that 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 edifice that grants us authority and instead focus on what value can we add to the student you know because i've i've seen it in previous semesters students come to class they yes that yes sir yes sir but then they go off and watch a youtube video and get their brain filled with crap mm -hmm. so if, if we replace that with this being the online experience, mm -hmm. how, can we, how can we curate essentially their playlist? How can we tailor what they're deciding to ingest? Um, and then I think there's, uh, being on the optimistic side of things, I think that there will be new methods for communication between ourselves and the students and between each other that will, I haven't explored that I, I, I feel, I intuit that somehow it's going to open up a lot more discussion that I would usually have in the classroom because instead of waiting for a turn, everyone can be chatting at the same time. Um, I, I think I'm, 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 that's me trying to be optimistic. I'm yeah. hoping that there'll be some kind of discussion there, but I'm, I really feel that the thing that I'm missing and I'm hoping the next couple of days will help me get a better idea of is how do I see how the student is feeling about what they're thinking, because that's the greatest key I find in classroom. That's the one bit of experience that I'm trying to get a, gra a grapple on. Um, Let me just point back, you, you, you might be right about individual courses and learning experiences that way. The university has all this concomitant stuff about it in the student experience of face-to-face. -face. And there's some, something like a biodiversity analogy where it's more than the sum of its parts. It's about the incidental connections. It's about, um, it's just, a, there's a physicality of being that is part of what we're all missing. And, we, and we, you know, you, you, these discussions are going on all around of why aren't I feeling, you know, what a, what's, what's been yanked away? And it's my kind of, almost like the sun is out of the solar system. I don't have a classroom to go back to. I don't have a, what am I just online now? Is this all through this thing? But, How is but, this but, but Jim, I, I, I think I know what you're talking about is that somehow being physically co-occupying the space forces interaction. 
But I think stripping that away also opens up the opportunity for interaction. You've because in, in, the past, in the past two weeks, I've had more meetings with people from more disciplines and faculties than I've had in the past three years. There are so new I, I think it's possible. Yeah, there's new there, there are new affordances. Instead of having to block off things like, oh, I got I to gotta walk from my office down to the oh, no. F wing. It takes me 10 minutes to get there. But, it's like, oh, I got to pop into this other Zoom meeting. But wait till, so, it's, yes, wait, it's till it's, but, wait till it's Sage Up Quebec. That's what it is, right? We don't need, <laughs> we just got, it's all cool. We can, um, it's all, you know, Starbucks and, and Taco Bell. Like it is the problem that with an 800 year experiment or more that has evolved from the primacy of location, from the need for location. You had to go here to get this. And this has been at, there's been a tug of war here since the 90s when e learning became you know, the first deans of e-learning started showing up, that eventually the physical place becomes obviated or reduced at least a lot. And eventually, eventually, you don't need to go somewhere. Um, so everybody. without the anchor that we're just going to drift away into the stratosphere? And well, no, you'll be, you'll be rank and file contract lecturers around commoditized programs that are linked to employers uh, Things will evolve, right? You can't stop, you know, the no. world from progressing. But there is something that we got to be careful. Like any biodiversity, when we lose it, it's hard to get it back. Doesn't mean that it won't be better. At what's coming? But the university is a very special place, and there's there's some kind of hidden layers that are, you know, taken for granted. Uh, that are kind of there's a climate change going on that get eroded and when those get yeah, but eroded, jim jim i think i think your your premise there is the idea is that yes it becomes like i sign up for a course and i go into this or i sign up for a raft of courses and somehow each person working in their in each little silo because there's no uh, cohesion uh, that's brought by the institution somehow uh, then, it, then it, it becomes a commodity you shop for physics over here you shop for chemistry yeah. stuff. but I think that the institutions even if you don't have the rooms we have groups like this this well, then we'll becomes see. our edifice that we're building it's not a physical thing it's tangibly we're building a social network that in amongst itself is what buttresses the learning experience for the student. If they don't, even if they don't see the back end, it's this kind of community that is what holds it together rather than just being like, oh, I want a side of fries with that. Hopefully, hopefully, we'll see. I mean, they, these are- That's the, me being optimistic. These I'll are the evolutionary forces. We all see the new things you can do online. There's plenty of things you can do asynchronously and synchronously that are unavailable. There's a reason we went to like 1,100 kids in our intro, you know, bio courses and social psych courses, right? Commoditizing wasn't, isn't a phenomenon only of e-learning. And, and so there's, that's part of the problem, like problem, problemizing, you know, active learning is how to beat back that, that sort of institutional commitment to cost. But anyway, that, that's, that's a decade or more of, change going forward but it's still this is going to probably accelerate some of that and you're going to see a lot of colleges closing and, and this sort of thing okay thanks jasmine go ahead sorry <laughs> oh it's okay chris can go i feel bad it's okay i'll, I'll talk Okay, perfect. Um, so I guess I'm still I'm still optimistic, even though like there are challenges that were brought to uh, brought forth um, here, and there are challenges that we talk about with our colleagues. And I, I agree, Jim, that I think when I entered undergrad, I want to say not too long ago, um, it was it was just like an experience, and like you go to you you go to specific classrooms, and you it, it, it's very different compared to when you're at your desk and you don't have that same environment and i think what we really have to do and this is what we've been i've been doing with my students already um, the ones that registered for the fall semester is really um keeping in contact with them having these office hours having a lot of zoom meetings with them so that they can um bring up their concerns tell them what they want out of the class um, what keeps from um the previous, so the winter semester, the, the few months that they had um, online, what worked for them and what didn't. I think that was also something that I took into account. Um, 
I also agree with Chris. I think I also spend more, I, I had more meetings now than I did before. And I think it's, it helps a lot to just even talk through Zoom. I know it, it take it does, it do, it's not the same as actually being at the university, but it does help to some extent, at least for students. And that's what I saw. Um, I also took notes on, um, uh, what did I say here? Oh yeah, so I think uh, Valerie has said um, that we are losing some, uh, so there will be some skills that the students will not have at the end of a remote class, but there are some other ones that will be strengthened. For example, there is a biochemistry class. Um, it's a lab-based class um, usually, but in the in remotely what they're going to do is spend more time on critically analyzing their writing because you, writing is not practiced enough in undergrad, at least in the sciences in our department. Um, also presenting your work orally so they're spending more time on different skills and that's going to be made very clear to the students like what the student outcomes are for that that one semester and then any lab based techniques any of those skills they might put more attention to it in the future classes and again what Alice said we have to just remind our students that this is going to be temporary they will have the chance to come into to school and, and get the other skills that they were promised. That's it. I was gonna um, pivot the conversation a little bit uh, and take it back to, I think one of the, the brilliant things about Saltis as a community, as a, a learning community, as a sharing community is that we, are continually bridging the gap between practice and research. And so wanted to raise the, the, the question of what kind of metrics, what kind of measurements are we gonna need to make as a community to understand this experiment? Um, because there is gonna be push, you know, there's always gonna be a push to say, oh, we can do it a whole lot more, uh, you know, less expensive, it can be less expensive if we do this. You know, the SAGEP system is a perfect example. It, it's certainly not, uh, you know, a money saver, but it does uh, give uh, students from, you know, the historical roots of the SEGEP system are really important and it does uh, give students access to higher education in a way that's unique in North America. So how, how do we, how do we say, you know, Jasmine, you were saying, you know, we poll students, I think it's incredibly important that we poll students, but sometimes what students like is not necessarily what's best for learning. And so I think, I think we need to, as a community, start to say, okay, what kind of measures, what kind of research can we do to find out what's working? So what do we keep and what do we throw out and how do we move forward? Uh, I'd love to hear people's thoughts on, you know, the importance, uh, you know, Jim, going back to your point, how do we justify this, this endeavor? How do we how do we show that uh, some things are working, some things are not working? I think that's a very challenging question on a short uh, on a short turnaround. But we've got an opportunity here because we're all in an experiment that we didn't plan, that we didn't expect. Let's see what we can find from it. I'd love to hear people's thoughts about that. Well, as it sort of when I just asked you to put me on the list, I just you prompted me on thinking uh, on this in terms of your know, opportunities here. We've uh, you, you know taking a look and going back to what the comp you know the Quebec has defined as a competency for a sage course, and really looking at how we can tease that out is is a you know this has prompted us to start doing that and maybe get a little more creative you know what does it mean to be good at physics doesn't necessarily you know is is it really best measured for instance by a sequestered problem solving session of solving a pile of problems in three hours without any support beyond a calculator um we moved to open book remote sort of uh, exams and and you know the the marks aren't comparable but i think there was an interesting value to seeing what the students did with that extra time and and you know the the freedom to look things up on the internet and I, I, th I think 
you know, in the, in the, in the very broad scheme, if it does sort of, um, if the notion that maybe we're not measuring the right things in, 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 the, the, in the way we normally do things, or maybe that, that maybe it might be good for the community and might be good for the, for, for you know, for, for, for the, for the network and for, um, you know, the Sage Up Network and just globally of re-examining, you know, what does it mean to be successful, to have successfully attained these learning objectives and, and, and as something that, you know, is a conversation that I, I'm, trying to prompt and uh, getting mixed results with that, but the, uh, moving beyond sort of the, you know, the exam as we think of it as a traditional exam, mm -hmm. being what decides that you're good at physics or you're not good at physics and, and thinking maybe a little bit more creatively around assessment um, is, a, is, a, is perhaps an opportunity. That, that's excellent. I just want to chime that K-12 is going to be in the same boat. They have, I mean, there's so many issues in K-12, um, particularly around equity and social justice issues, environmental justice issues. Um, but they have recognized now that their students are not as um, engaged from home. They're not learning as much from home. You can't cover as much. Um, and so all of these teachers, I mean, it's kind of a moment. It's not necessarily a negative moment. They're basically going to be asked uh, to revisit their learning goals for the course. And in a, in a potentially productive way to say, what do you really want these kids to get? And there's this sort of a, a, an accompanying question, which is, <clears throat> what is it that when they're learning, they're going to get into this? They're going to get excited by this. They're going to be engaged by this. So that you're essentially you have this kind of new moment of saying, I got to step back away and really look at what I'm trying to get across, what I really want to look for from them, and how I want to talk to them about, you know, not only how they're learning, but why they're learning. And so I, th I think it's, yeah, I think it, it, there's a chance for this to open up a lot of stuff going forward in K-12 and higher education. Can I just jump back in and, and say, so what kind of evidence do we need to make sure that whatever veering or changing direction happens is, is one that's based on, on some fact and not just on some penny pincher's idea of what should be done? I, w I was not, if I, if I wouldn't put, Eva on the spot a little bit. Um, maybe you can give us some thoughts on 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 some of these because Eva's done a lot of um, of research in that that field of BSBL, um, or you might call it distance learning, or I don't know how you want to define it, Eva. Um, but what kind? You know, to answer both Chris's questions, but also to uh, to go back to a comment you made a little while back, which is uh, one of economics, which I think sort of was a, an earlier theme as well. Um, the fact is that distance learning isn't economically uh, um, really less uh, um, of a stress of a threat a strain if it's done well, and so. By answering the question that Chris is posing, you know, like what kinds of metrics, might we also ask ourselves the question about, you know, what does well look like? If we were to do it well, what should it look like? Um, and could that give us some of those answers that, you know, Jim uh, is, you know, is posing as well? At least I'm hearing in Jim's comments. Oops, lucky. Sorry, it's my dog. But um, yeah, there's a lot of, can you hear me, Liz? Yes. There's a lot of interrelated issues that were coming up, but um, the issue of reassessing what learning outcomes we really care about in K-12 and in higher ed, and different learning outcomes are afforded by different scenarios. So 
an interactive online learning environment isn't as good for memorization and for checking in on the acquisition of core knowledges. It's better at problem solving, critical thinking, all these other things. And I think that's a huge shift though. For some disciplines, it seems very hard. From colleagues I'm talking to, I see that they're still very rooted in, no, no, all this content has to be covered. And if you look at the Quebec curriculum for K to 11, who can blame them? Because much of it is still very content oriented, especially like in the sciences. I can't believe what they try and cover here in the sciences in K to 11. And then they keep saying it's competency based, but it's actually mostly a bunch of knowledge, right? Like there's so much knowledge there and the poor teacher, you can't do everything. So maybe it's a good moment to reconsider what we really care about. And in higher ed, we have more freedom to determine that than in K to 11. Um, but definitely in DE, I remember back in the day, I took some correspondence courses way back when, if everyone remembers the old model, they sent you papers and then you filled them out and then you eat, you mailed them in and then they sent you, you, it corrected back and then you were allowed to start your next assignment. And that was the old days. And I have friends right now who I respect and love who are recreating that in the year 2020 by putting it on Moodle and they're really proud of it too. Like they're like, look, I made this and I made this and I made this. And I'm like, yeah, but that's just, it's a self-paced distance education course and it's content oriented there's no collaboration amongst the students there's no real interaction with the faculty and i'm like well that seems like the 70s baby like that's a long time ago and but it's not in distance ed it's not it's like a we can't get out of this loop because that is a cheap way you pay people up front like at stanford they can pay people a ton of money up front to create these courses and then they can run them off people who aren't even professors at all because the content was where the main work went, but then the students aren't interacting with faculty or students. I think that's the end of higher ed. My, like, that's it for me. Like, that's not what I think university is supposed to give. That's the cheap model. All the other models involve, you know, the faculty members actually spending more time with the students, being more interactive, being more engaged in active learning. And those cost money because you can't, yeah. If you have like, I remember when I taught my first online course, we were, we were graduate students. Of course, we were willing to teach 180 classes if it was four classes of 20, but your average faculty member doesn't have the time to take a class of 80 and pretend it's four classes of 20 and create the awesome online engaged interactive. So I don't know where these, you know, I, I know some models, they have a prof and then they have like moderators they pay and they're paid less than a prof to keep the interaction going, but I haven't even heard people talking like that. And I, I, I know the universities feel pinched, but without that, we're gonna have really bad online courses. Like it's expensive, it's not cheap. It's not actually cheaper at all. So that's a big concern to me that we're in a bad place. I'm not giving you any answers, Liz, but I am, I am showing that it's a big problem and they're all interlocked problems. If we want, it's cheap to have 400 students in a lecture hall at McGill. That's cheap. It's expensive to have classes of 40 with intensive interaction. And we, in many institutions, that's now reserved for the higher up people. But that, that, Ava, that's where, that's where active learning was pushing, right? That was my experience at Saltese. And I did this project in California where we, we basically took a 600 person um, computer science course and turned it into you know, 30 active learning sessions. And that's been the voice of educators saying, no, 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 like you really want, you don't want people to get a good grade and get out with a degree. That's a Kohlberg level like two, you know, <laughs> like you gotta get, it's not what the learning's about. The learning's about these competencies. It's about <clears throat> deep disciplinary knowledge, epistemic knowledge, <clears throat> fluency, multidisciplinarity, and to do that, you need talented ed educators, fantastic materials and activities. And yes, you can do this online. I believe you can, but it, you're exactly right. It's not gonna be cheap. <laughs> and it's probably the, uh, something like Saltese, even though we are the choir, by the way, but it probably is something like Saltese that's going to be able to, I mean, offer that check. It's gonna be, with the, there's some speed bumps that are needed or you're going to see institutions 
across this country and the world <clears throat> jumping on solutions that have been proven. Oh, wow, we, we never knew it was that easy to do a whole program online. Wow, okay, so let's go because we ran the numbers on it. So I think Saltese really has a not only a, an opportunity to craft what we mean <laughs> by this new world, but also a kind of almost a, <clears throat> there's a real need for a voice to come up and say, don't, don't pretend that you can outsource the problem like this. Don't pretend that you can just solve it with emergency measures that worked, you know, like that stopgap. Our kids are absolutely not engaged and we are not able to offer those kind of quality experiences with <clears throat> poor pedagogy. So like it or not, we're up against making online learning good. Um, sucks, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> so we're uh, three minutes away from our uh, uh, deadline of five. Um, we have tomorrow and uh, the next day as well. So it's uh, these ideas are, 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 we can still continue them in different, with a different, slightly different focus uh, tomorrow. Um, uh, thank you all for, for coming. And uh, is there anyone who desperately wanted to say something and didn't get a chance to? Um, uh, um, or is there someone who, feels like they need to say something to say goodbye to all of us for the evening. Uh, please jump in and, and, and say uh, a parting word as it clocks the clock down to uh, midnight and we all turn into pumpkins, uh, especially those who've been online since, uh, what hour were you up uh, online, Jim? Uh, our first meeting was at nine, but I had to get ready for it. Um. <laughs> so um, yeah, this this uh, you know this would be very long days. I thank you all for a very rich conversation. Yeah, let, let, really? let me let me say you're going to say goodbye. I just want to say community is the thing, and that's what this thing is here. That's my research. I've talked about that at Salty's meetings before. This is what people miss when they're out on their own trying to fight these fights, and so bringing you back into this town hall and getting people connected to each other and getting these voices is, I mean, this is the beginning because we're all going into the summer and we're gonna get ready for the fall. So this town hall, I hope <clears throat> what you know, Chris and Liz and these guys are, are building uh, is something that's gonna carry through the summer into all the planning that you have to do into the fall where we're actually, we're not just sort of you know, emergency handling it, although that's kind of what we are doing, but it's got to become a little bit more from survive to strive and maybe even thrive. And this community is what's going to help us kind of keep that and, and, and share those resources and, and stay in touch with each other. So I hope that is what comes out of this town hall three day event is that we all gain a little bit more confidence that Saltees is here and it's it's going to help us um, handle the situation. That's a really wonderful way of uh, wrapping this up, Jim. And uh, I will share the, um, uh, the the recording, or we'll figure out how to share the recording. I thank uh, I'd like to thank Sue and Lorraine and Chow uh, for being here and and uh, making sure that we're okay. Sue in particular, because she's been making sure that. Uh, Things have run smoothly, and uh, and people were lent, let in, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, see you tomorrow, and uh, and thanks, and uh, um, have a good evening. Bye, everyone. Bye. Sorry, thanks so much, Jim. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hey, Liz, did you say? Did you see? I said I love. We love you, Liz. Yeah, we oh, said that to Liz. Oh, well, <laughs> we would, we I, would, lo yeah. I love you back. This is, this is the, you know, I, I, you know, I think Jim, you know, your notion of community, this is absolutely the thing that keeps us going. Um, so powerful and thank